So I feel that my father-in-law's, and I call him Bub, so if you hear the word Bub, it's, it means, <laughs> that's what I call him. Uh, don't get thrown off by that. I feel like he said one thing and another thing was heard regarding the giving issue. And I do want to give him a chance again to state what he believes. And I think after you hear what he believes and what he actually said, you will say, hey, I, can't, I cannot read my Bible and disagree with that. And again, it is the Word of God, not our opinions and not our practices that form our culture. It is the Scriptures that we come to with an open heart that create the culture of our lives. So, uh, Bub, do you believe in giving to the Lord? Absolutely. I would like, if possible, to uh, say a few things yeah, first. Please. Because I don't think people may understand who are watching, and this uh, is important because so many people have wanted to uh, interview me the last few days, and I said, no, I'm not going to talk to anyone because this is a heart issue. Mm -hmm. This is my soul. And the way I view my uh, relationship with the Lord. And this has nothing to do with anyone saying anything. This has nothing to do with critics. I don't really even care anymore what critics say about me. That's not important. Nor do I even listen to that. I really don't. I used to when I was younger, but no more. But... Um, I'd like to answer that, that question in a little bit, maybe no. down a little, few minutes from now. But I want to start, Michael, by really focusing on the Lord and why all this has happened. So, I cannot uh, explain, <clears throat> I cannot explain everything to you tonight, there's no way. But it's been a, a lifelong walk that has come to a very special place today in my heart with the Lord. Um, I don't know how long I have to live. I really don't. I'm 67 almost. I began preaching when I was 21. I had the most beautiful beginning very beautiful. Um, I'm sure many of the people have heard the name Catherine Kuhlman, but I don't know how many of them had ever been to any of her meetings like I have. You cannot forget that experience. There is no way for you, young people, or anyone else who had not been to Catherine Kuhlman's meetings to have any idea of the change that can happen in your life if you are in those meetings or you were in those meetings. So when you see the YouTube uh, uh, footage and other things people have seen, it doesn't do anything to your average person looks and said, oh, you know, he doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. But I was in my 20s when I went to Catherine's meetings. I would say this, and, and, I, and I'm saying this to explain something, but to be in those meetings would be no different than had I been on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord. The presence of Jesus, you, no way to explain it when she walked on that platform. It was instant glory you began to weep immediately. Before she would even utter a word, you're crying, and you feel this heavenly atmosphere that was so pure. 
to the place when you left the room or the church was in. You did not realize till you got outside how glorious it was inside. Wow. Because the oppression outside became real. Mm. See, we live today with oppression all around us. We've become accustomed to it. Did you understand that? Yeah. But when you're in that presence, there is no oppression. Demons cannot function in that presence. So you walked into the service, you sat for a good hour, sometimes longer. At the first meeting, I think we sat for two hours before Ms. Kuman came on. Mm. Cold uh, weather in Pittsburgh back in the December 73 when I went for the first time. I will never, th this cannot be erased out of my life. I will never forget when she walked on that platform or to the pulpit. It was the first Presbyterian church downtown Pittsburgh. It's still there. Mm. When she came on that, uh, when she walked out, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Wow. The atmosphere became so heavenly, I wasn't sure if I was alive. I thought, this cannot be on earth anymore. It was very, very... Uh, and it's very difficult even now to explain it. It was at that time very difficult to know where am I? Am I still on earth? Mm. And the glory of the Lord, the reality, listen, I've been in, uh, in my own crusades, I've been in other meetings with other people. No one had mm. that. And I don't even know if to call it the anointing because it's way more than the anointing mm -hmm. that was there. The visible, and I want to ex explain the visible presence of the Lord was there even though you could not see him. The visible presence, he became so tangible. It, it was more real than to see him with your physical eyes. And when I would say something, he would answer me like that. Wow. So when I, when I stood there in, in, in tears, and the first words out of my mouth, have mercy on me, Lord, because I felt so filthy. Wow. Because when the glory is there, all you see is your sin. Mm. And I said, have mercy on me. And I heard him immediately, like instantly, my mercy is abundant on you. And I, I, I was speechless. It was that reality that changed me. So, uh, prior to that, when I was a child, maybe 11 years old, and I saw the Lord in a dream, I, I wasn't saved. I was extremely Greek Orthodox, like mm -hmm. you were. I was an altar boy in the church, extremely religious. We knew nothing about salvation or the new birth but we were very devout Greek Orthodox mm -hmm. I had uh, I had memorized the Bible as a boy we had to uh, because of the nuns Catholics nuns that that brought me up that uh, I, I was educated by the Catholics in Jaffa but yet my, my church was Greek Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And so on Sunday, I'd be in the Greek Orthodox church. Monday through Friday, I was in the Catholic schools. And they would take us to Mass every morning in the Catholic church. So I grew up in a religious uh, life, you know. That's mm -hmm. all we knew is church and school and friends and neighbors. Mm -hmm. And when the Lord uh, came amazing day in my life. I was 10, 11 years old. If I close my eyes now, I can see him. Wow. I mean, that is so imprinted in my soul, you cannot remove it from my life. So that's the real me. The, the real me is what happened when I was a kid 
and what happened at Catherine Kuhlman the first time. Mm -hmm. the, these were the massive imprints, I would call them, uh, the, the changes, the headlines of my soul. Mm -hmm. Everything else is not that important. Mm -hmm. So, um, we had a very beautiful childhood in Israel. I grew up uh, living with the, with the Bible all around me. I mean, imagine being born a block away from the house of Simon the Tanner. <laughs> and every time you went to school, you saw the house of Simon the Tanner. <laughs> and Bible sites all around. Amazing. And the tourists would come and look around in Jaffa and I'd go to Tabitha once a year. We all had to go to Tabitha, where Tabitha, you know, was. Dorcas uh, was raised from the dead. And it was a feast every year. And everybody had to go wow. to celebrate the resurrection of Tabitha when Peter came. So we all lived in this religious life. And I did not know the Lord. Mm -hmm. I knew so much about the Lord I didn't know the Lord himself. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Catholic nuns made us, uh, oh my Lord goodness. I was so educated by those amazing Catholic sisters who were not charismatic Catholics. They were just very tough <laughs> ladies. Um, <clears throat> that that I, I, I put, I, I, I took all the, the uh, they give us these beautiful Bible uh, uh, books with all the pictures from when, when the Lord was born till the resurrection. Wow. So all his life was in pictures with a lot of different writings, you know. And, and, and I would, uh, the class had to put all the pictures in order. So the pictures, they, would, they gave them to us, and then we all put them in books in order. And I had that for many, many years in my, in, in my home. Uh, in school, we learned the Hebrew Bible, mandatory. Wow. So imagine I was already in Bible school and did not know it. So uh, we had to learn the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. Incredible. So that's the kind of life I began. So you have to understand who I really am. Forget what people say and what people see on This Is Your Day and or they used to see and they still do it. The real Benny Hinn, I just, I just talked about him. So now we moved to Canada. I, I got saved in 72. Uh, the 14th of February, 7.50 in the morning. In class, right? In class, in, in school, yeah. High school, George Vanier. And, and, and when, uh, when the morning I got saved, I didn't even know uh, how to pray the sinner's prayer. It's these kids in, in class who kept inviting me to go to prayer, and I thought they were all crazy. Because I thought I was the only Christian. I thought they were all a little cuckoo. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, like, I'm from Israel, and I grew up knowing the Bible better than they do, and I knew it even at the time. Uh, and they would all look at me and say, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. And I didn't know what to say to them. And they just would not give up on me. So uh, the day before I got saved... The day before I got saved, something happened to me. Oh. Now, remember the Lord, that, that the Lord appeared to me when I was 11, okay? But then nothing happened after that. The night before I got saved, I had a dream. And in the dream, uh, I saw an angel. Wow. I'll never forget that. And the angel said, uh, oh, by the way, I, this, this is something that, could scare some of you. I saw myself in the dream. I saw myself going into what looked like a, a long stairway into a pit with prisoners. There was prisoners chained. We were all chained one to another. 
And there was these little creatures with, uh, you know, what do we call those forks? Yeah, like rods. Yeah. Uh-huh. They, were, they, they looked like half humans and half animals all over the place in this dark stairway. And there was no way out. And it was going down, down deep into darkness. And I was one of the prisoners uh, attached and were all chained to each other. And suddenly an angel appeared in the, in the pit. Down, as, as, as I'm going down the stairs, an angel showed up and he did this to me. No one saw him in the dream except me. He did this. And my chains fell off. Wow. And I went over. Wow. And he took me by, by there and he said, come with me. And from out of nowhere, a door opened. And I was out. And, and now he took me by the hand. I don't know who the angel is. I know I didn't, he didn't introduce himself to me. And, he, and we flew in, in the air. And he took me and landed me right in the spot where I got saved. In your high school? Yeah. yeah wow. This the next the night morning. Huh? This was the night before. The night before. He took me and, and I literally landed in the dream, in the dream at the spot. And I woke up having no idea what that meant. Wow. Within hours after that, I'm in school and I am right in that spot, literally. And these kids began praying in tongues. I, I, <laughs> I never heard anyone pray in tongues. So I, like, I was... I was scared. I was like, looked at, at this. But when they began praying in tongues, I felt something come on me. This was during the Jesus movement. Jesus movement was very, very strong, yeah. yeah. I felt this something come over me, and I did not know how to say, come into my heart. Nobody, none of the kids said anything. Not one of them said, you know, here's how you get saved or nothing. They just began praying in tongues, and I'm just sitting there, staring, scared to death, <laughs> and feeling this feeling on me, and I began crying. I didn't know it would be such an emotional moment, and, and I put my head down, and, and, and I'm thinking, like, what do I do now? And out of, my, out of my mouth, all I said is, Jesus, come back, come back. Because I thought he left. Because when, when I was a kid, you know. Uh, so, excuse me. Uh, anyway, so that's how I prayed. I didn't know what to say because nobody said pray after me. So I just said, come back. So I'm, I'm walking now and they're all praying in tongues. And you know, everybody just left. We didn't have a whole lot. It was not that long of a prayer meeting. So I'm walking through the hallways to my class, feeling like something has happened to me. I didn't even know how to describe it. I walk into the class. We had the toughest French teacher. Oh, dear God, she was tough. She was a short French woman. And, uh, and I was in, 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 in my French class. I was taking French in, because I, I grew up speaking French. People don't know that. I, I spoke three languages as a child, fluently. I spoke Arabic, Hebrew, and French. Today I speak some Arabic, and I understand French, but, and my, my English is getting better. <laughs> but anyway, so I walk into my French class, and the teacher was teaching on the French Revolution. And my cousin, Selwa, who is now a very famous doctor, sat across the, the, the aisle from me, and I felt, I don't know how to, how to say it, I felt Jesus was going to come to talk to me in class. I, 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 I just said, come back, in the, in the library it happened, and I go through the hallway, I'm sitting in class with kids all around me, and some, something told me, he's coming. Wow. And I put my head down. I was so scared. I put my head down like that. With the, with the French class going on, the, the teacher is teaching. This lady is going on up there. And I put my head down, and I saw him coming towards me. 
Wow. Walking on the Sea of Galilee, wearing a white robe, I began crying so loud. And I said, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And the, the, the whole class stopped. <laughs> the teacher didn't know what to do. My cousin Selwa kept saying, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> You're like this. <laughs> when I grew up, they gave me a nickname. Tutu was my nickname. <laughs> so she said, Tutu, shh, shh, Tutu, quiet. Shh, shh, shh. And I didn't care about her telling me to be quiet. And I'm going, Jesus, I love you, I love you. Because I saw him coming to me. And yet, even then, no one told me, well, here's how you pray the Lord, the sinner's prayer. So those same kids came uh, after this. said, listen, we want you to come with us Thursday night to the catacombs. I never heard of what the catacombs was. The catacombs at, in those days was in St. Paul's Cathedral in, in Toronto. There was a great revival in the Anglican Church that seated 3,000. The lady and her husband, Merv and Nola Watson, she wrote Jehovah Jireh. The song Jehovah Jireh was written by Merla. Well, Merv and her had these meetings downtown uh, in, in, in Toronto. The speaker happened to be Lorne Cunningham. So the kids take me there from the school, the same kids that prayed in tongues and others from the high school that, that took me to that service. I'm sitting there, I'm like this. I'm shaking the whole time. And I, to this, to my dying day, I'll, I will remember his sermon, every, almost every word of it which is amazing. I can still remember that. It was the first man I ever heard preach that I really understood because when we were kids, if you remember, they, you know, carry a lesson, carry a lesson, carry a lesson, and they would chant, and the priest would pray in Greek, and I had no clue what he was saying. And the Catholics uh, would speak in Latin, pray in Latin. I didn't speak Latin or Greek. So we just sat in church and looked around, you know, but that was the first time I actually was glued listening to a man. And then he gave an altar call. And the same voice that I had heard that same week. That was Monday I got saved. This is Thursday. So Thursday night I'm sitting in that church. Uh, the big Anglican church. And, and when Lorne gave the altar call, a voice said, go down. And I said, but I'm already a Christian. And the voice became firm, go down. So I was down. I was the, almost, I think, the f first one down. And that's when I made a public confession. So that was a great beginning for me. And then my family began to persecute me. They didn't understand why I would change so drastically. I mean, I went from going to church only on Sunday down on Young Street in Toronto and Easter and, and, and Christmas, to now I'm in church every night, and it's not Greek Orthodox. Uh, so Sunday, uh, I began to go to the church where many of the catacombs people, the Watsons, went to. Uh, it was a powerful uh, time in my life. They met in a farm up in Markham, and uh, there was a pastor named Jimmy McAllister, very powerful Bible teacher. And at, at, at night I would go to Maxwell White's church. Maxwell White was probably one of the greatest teachers on the blood. People can still read his books. And every Sunday night he would, he, he would cast out demons after the service. So a lot of the kids from that I had gotten to befriend said, come on with us, want to show you how this man can cast out devils. I was so hungry, I said, let's, I said, I'm ready for anything, let's just go. And every Sunday night, I would go to his church. He was a powerful man, powerful. The anointing was something else. And after church, he would say to anybody, said, if, if you have a devil, I'll meet you in the basement. And people would go down to the basement. And all of us kids would just go to watch. We, we, we didn't have devils. We just wanted to watch this guy cast them out. So they would put him in a, they would put him in a circle 
who, who, whoever had a devil had to sit on the chair. And we kids would just stand in the back and watch the guy. And he would walk in. He was a short, stocky British man from England. He would walk in and say, the blood, the blood, the blood. He was a thick voice. And the second he would walk in, everybody would start going crazy down below. Throwing up, foaming, rolling on the floor. Chairs start flying. It was frightening. But he just walked in. And, and the first thing he would say, the blood of Jesus. And they just start going crazy. People would just, the same people who were up there singing songs were now going nuts down below. And I was not sure, I was not sure what's going on. How could it be they looked so sweet up there and so crazy down here? But I was, I was introduced in my early days to the genuine uh, message of the gospel. And, and that went on, uh, this was 72 in 73, in 73, at the end is when I went, when I went to Miss Kuman. And I'm sharing all this to answer your question. I'll get yeah. to it. Bob, can you talk about, though, uh, because maybe there's people that don't understand, raised in our culture to not attend the church you grew up in. Oh, dear it God. It wasn't a small matter in your family. You paid a you, price. You've got to understand this. I was baptized by the patriarch of Jerusalem. That's how he gave me his name. My, my first name was not Benny. I had a Christian name when I was born. Benedictus is my real name. Benedictus for benediction. So I didn't want to call myself Benedictus. It says that on my passport, but who can say Benedictus? <laughs> and my, my name, my real name, can I give him a little history before I answer that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. My, my father's family moved from Greece to Egypt, and Christians were getting killed in Egypt. This is back early 1900s. One of my dad's uncles was a preacher. No, nobody knew that. My grandfather changed his name because he did not want the Muslims to kill him. So if, if you have a Christian name in our part of the world, you can, can, you, you can be killed. So my grandfather, who almost became a priest, Greek Orthodox, he was, he, 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 was, he, he was fluent in Greek, my grandpa. So he changed his name to Tufik, T-O-U-F-I-K, Tufik, because he was afraid that the Muslims would kill him. So it, he changed his name from a Christian name. Like if you're called George, you're a Christian. If you're called uh, whatever, but if you have a certain Arabic name, then you stay alive. And a lot of Christians took on these different names so they wouldn't get killed. His brother got killed. He stayed alive by changing his name. So they had to call all firstborn Tufik in the family to honor the memory. So when I was born, I was called Tufik Benedictus. All, the, all my cousins are called Tufik. There's a lot of Tufiks running around. So when we moved to Canada, they could not say Tufik. People couldn't say my name. Yeah. I'm sitting in class. This is before I got saved. I'm sitting in class. And on the PA, the principal came and said, would Toothpick Hen please come to the office? When he said Toothpick, I said, I'm done with the name. I'm gone. I went to a lawyer. I, I actually went to a lawyer. I hired a lawyer to change my name. I said, I don't want to live the rest of my life being called Toothpick. I said, change my name. I canceled Toothpick. Totally. And, but I kept Benedictus. So today on my passport, it says Benedictus Hen. Yeah, but my first name, it really hurt my dad. But I said, listen, dad, I don't want people calling me Toothpick. So in Canada, you know, whatever. But... The, the, the patriarch baptized me, gave me his name. Now, when I became a Christian, born again, the patriarch of Jerusalem came all the way from Jerusalem to Canada to stop me. Oh, yes. Yes, ask Rose. The, the patriarch is like the Pope. The, the Greek Orthodox Church doesn't have popes. They, they have a lot of patriarchs. There's the one in Istanbul, in Jerusalem, in Athens, all that. The one from Jerusalem came all the way to Toronto to stop me. 
He told my father that I'm a crazy man, me, and that my father needs to stop me. That's the, the, you know, Rosa tell you all those stories. She was there, my sister. And that's why they were trying to think. My daddy took me to a psychiatrist. They stuck plugs in my head. I forget that. <laughs> so the persecution was heavy. To leave the Greek Orthodox Church, it's just you don't do that. You just don't. So you're, you're going to hell. You're, you're done. It's over for your life. And I was literally cut out. My daddy would not speak to me for three years because I got saved. And he thought I had gone cuckoo. And he was embarrassed. He was like, how can you do that to us? How can you leave the, the faith and the church? And, you know, they, they, they're very, very, very hard uh, culture. And that's where Michael comes from. We come from the same culture. So thank you for saying that. But when I got into the ministry, I was so scared. I didn't tell my father because my father told me, he said, the day you preach, you'll no longer be my son. And they don't make, you know, empty threats in our world. And I was so scared to tell my dad I was preaching. And when the Lord called me in a very powerful way, and I began preaching, uh, he, he forbade me from witnessing to my brothers and sisters about the Lord. I still did it in secret in our home. Mary got saved. Willie got saved. Sammy got saved. They were all getting saved except my dad and my mom. And my, uh, I had gone down to preach at a church, and my father still didn't, did not know I was saved. Uh, sorry, I was in the ministry. Uh, he, he, he saw it in, in an ad in the Toronto Star. The preacher decided to put a little ad and my, with my picture, and my father happened to see the newspaper. He showed up with my mom to the, to the church. When I saw him, I said to the man with me, a saint of God named Jim Porter, I said, Jim, you better pray. I said, this is it tonight. I said, my, I, I, said, I will have no home to, to go to tonight. Can I come to your house? And he said, of course. He was a wonderful saint, wonderful. He was a free Methodist pastor, this man, that was so helpful in my early days. So he was with me, and my mom and my dad sat way in the back, not completely motionless. You know how they can be. The Greek Orthodox, they just stare at you. <laughs> and, and I said, this is it. So I waited till 2 in the morning. I, I, I said to Jim, I said, let's wait till they really are sleeping. I said, I'll go home, get my stuff, and I'll leave, and you can wait for me outside so I can go. I walk in. My mom and my dad are sitting there waiting for me. I said, this is it. Oh, I was scared to death. And the first words out of my father's mouth, how can we become like you, son? Yeah. And he got saved. And uh, he, he told me later, and my mom told me later, she, she said, well, when you were preaching, she, she, she said, we were in shock. And she said, my daddy looked at my mom, and he said, that's not your son. His God must be real. Huh? Yeah, yeah. That was after your tongue got Because loose. I used to stutter one when I was a kid. Badly, like real bad and the stutter. the first time you preached, the Lord loosed it, right? First time I preached, my tongue was healed, yeah. Wow. But, but my, my daddy would not talk to me, and my mom was forbidden. They, they were for, forbidden to even look at me. My mom was the sweetest, of course. She always was the loving one. But my daddy didn't know nothing. So now I get, you know, I'm in the ministry and things began to change. I go to Catherine. But let, let me just kind of jump and take it to where I really need to, because we, we don't have a whole week. That'll take me a long time to talk about this. But. So I get in the ministry. I begin traveling. The Catherine Woman Fo Foundation dis, uh, finds out that God is using me. I met a lady named Marty Phillips, who used to work for Miss Kuman. Catherine wanted to meet me 1970. Uh, Five, the end of 75, the meeting never happened because she was in the hospital. Wow. I, I got to know the staff. They got to know me. Ms. Kuman passed February 20th, 76. February 20th, 77, I began to work with them. I was the speaker to my shock. I was 20, 24 years old, and I was invited by Maggie Hartner, who ran the Kuman ministry, 
to conduct Catherine Kuma's memorial service. Wow. So here I am, nobody knew my name, uh, a Canadian from Israel uh, that I preached only in Canada in those days. Now I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the Carnegie Music Hall uh, having to preach for the Catherine Kuman Foundation to honor Catherine Kuman's memory. And it was a memorial service one year after she passed. And when the part of God hit, they were all in shock. And Maggie came up to me and she looks at me, she said, kiddo, you got it. I had no clue what she meant by kiddo, you got it. And then I got to understand, she said, no one that we, they, they'd ever met had that anointing like Miss Kuman. And I was quite shaken up. I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't know what, what to say. So I worked with them from 77 till about 81, 80, 81. And I would go every month and I traveled with them all over the U.S. That's how people got, got to know me. We went everywhere showing Miss Kuman's film. Uh, that's still on YouTube. You can still see it. Rivers and called the uh, Dry Land, Living Water. I, I I know that that service. I can tell you when she'll be breathing again on it because I saw it so many times. Because I we 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 would show the film and then I would preach. We did it everywhere for like four years, and then every month I would preach in Pittsburgh at the uh, uh, Soldiers and Sailors Auditorium for them. So preachers began to invite me. So we, when we would go to the big, big churches in the U.S. and Canada, the preachers would say, would you come back to the, our church? So I became extremely busy for a long, long time till I moved to Orlando. Uh, Roy Harden, you sweet people don't know that, had the biggest church here. Calvary Assembly down on I-4, that was his church. And he invited, to, he invited me to come and preach uh, 19... Um, Goodness, it was July of uh, 78. July 78 is when I came to Orlando first time. But I'll tell you something really interesting. I used to come to Cocoa Beach. I had friends in Cocoa. John or not, you know who John or not is? Toronto, from, uh, from the Toronto, Toronto Blessing. Blessing yeah. He had a house in Melbourne, and he used to work with me. People don't know that. And so he had me come to his home in Cocoa Beach. And... Uh, the Lord spoke to me one day to come and pray all day long in Orlando. I had no idea why Orlando. Wow. So I prayed in a hotel right by Disney. Mm -hmm. It's still there. I spent the whole day with the Lord. And I had no clue that God had a plan. That was, in, that was maybe 75 wow. when I came to Orlando and prayed all day, not knowing God would send me back. So 78, I preached at Calvary. The part of God was so awesome. They asked me to, to come back for Tuesday and Wednesday which I did at that time, uh, you know, Alex Klattenberg was the youth pastor. Wow. So Alex said, would you come back, preach for the Tuesday youth meeting? I said, yes. Then I stayed for Wednesday. It was quite a beginning for me. I ended up marrying Roy's daughter, Suzanne, and now I have kids who are half English. <laughs> Thank God you but yeah, that. but anyways, ministry began to, to grow and then Roy left Calvary. And the only reason I began OCC is because Roy left the church. Uh, and I don't want to get into why. So that big building you see on I-4 is his church. That's the one he planned. I still remember when he showed us the, the plans for the building that you see, that you see standing. So when I began uh, to, to uh, come to f actually Florida, I began here in Orlando. But then uh, we began OCC here, and now it's history. The Crusades began, and when the Crusades began, uh, for a long time, things went really sweet and wonderful. 91 was Phoenix? 90, it was 1990, March of 1990. Okay. And I, uh, in about, uh, and I'll answer your question now. In about early 2000, uh, you know, when you have a big ministry like uh, the, in, in those days, you get to know some very, very powerful people. And they become your friends. And you begin to listen to them. Because you look up to these people. And the matter of prosperity was uh, something that... Uh, some of them talked about 
forcefully. When I started in ministry for a long time, I was not uh, into that at all. It started uh, during the Crusades and uh, not much in OCC. OCC was very normal, just you take the tithe and you're done, you know, tithe offerings. Um, but the whole mentality uh, of the subject came up maybe late 1999, somewhere there, early 2000, when I would be invited to telephones. And to my shock, uh, they would tell me that I raised more money than anyone. And that's really when people began to say, uh, you know, to me in a very sweet way, privately, uh, uh, what is it I believe? And people don't know this. Some of my, some of the closest friends I had at one time were all Baptist preachers. This bishop bish may actually shock you. Uh, Charles Stanley came and spent the whole day with me in California when he went through his divorce. And he was, uh, I, I, I will never forget the day I spent with Charles Stanley. Uh, that's one of the sweetest people on the planet. And uh, one of the greatest men of God alive is Dr. Charles Stanley. I was, I was amazed, amazed by his knowledge of Scripture and the Holy Spirit. Was, uh, I, I, would, I would tell everyone here uh, to really listen to this man on TV. Charles Stanley is the real thing. Uh, Jerry Falwell befriended me. And... Uh, Gracious man, very gracious man. Bill Bright was my friend. I would have lunch with Bill Bright here in Orlando every month. People didn't even know that. He, he actually preached for me. And Tim LaHaye became my friend. And uh, they, some of them brought that up. They said, now, Benny, do you really believe that stuff? They would say. And uh, they loved uh, everything else but that. You know, they, they would... You know, Jerry Falwell said to me one day, he said, you know, he said, when I watch you preach the word of God, he said, I see no difference between you and I. When I see you give those altar calls, no difference between you and I. When you lead in worship, no difference than your crusades and Thomas Road Baptist Church. But he said, when those miracles begin, it's downhill from there. But, but he, was, he was troubled by my, at that time, my understanding, maybe I would say, and stand on prosperity. Um, but I didn't really do anything about it. Because my, the, the, the people around me were very strong pro-message. And that went on for a while. Um, but then... The, 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 the change, I mean, in my real life, in my real heart, sometimes I would go home and think, well, mm, you know, is, my, is, is this really me? Is this? But I wasn't sure. And about two and a half years ago, it started. Sometimes God takes a long time to wake us up. I don't know why. Someday I think I'm going to ask him. But... I, 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 I just made a decision to really, really get to know the scriptures. I've always read the word, always, always. And one day I just made a decision that I'm going to read the Bible three times a year. Through, yeah. Now, is your mic still, still on? Is, yeah, I yeah. Right I just made a decision to read the word three times a year. All the way through. All the way, from Genesis to Revelation. Three times. And, and uh, not only that, but even the commentaries. And that's something that began to really affect me in a good way. I've always been a lover of the scriptures. I was a pastor for many, many years. I studied when I was here in OCC uh, for my own soul and for the people of God. 
And I still do very much study the scriptures, but I do it for myself mostly now. And as I read the scriptures through again and again and again, and then I decided to begin reading the Bible in Hebrew to resurrect my Hebrew. And uh, I'm getting really good with that, by the way. You are. Oh, yeah. In fact, I'm teaching Hebrew now. And I, uh, about a year and a half ago, I decided to uh, be a student of Hebrew University. And every Tuesday I go to school online. I'm the only student because I want to be. <laughs> and I'm, I'm learning the Bible with it, it, the Hebrew language is so precious and so deep and powerful. It's, there's no way to describe it. But a, a, as I'm reading the word in a new way, a lot of things began to come alive. Not just that. Prosperity yeah. is a very small line on the bottom of the list when it comes to what I'm looking for, for my soul, I mean, for my life. So I began to uh, ask myself, are you there here? Like uh, there are things, Michael, in the scriptures about God that uh, make me cry and still to this day make me cry. I'm reading Jeremiah, and the Lord says to Jeremiah, if I find one man in Jerusalem who is righteous, I'll spare the city. And I began to weep. I said, Lord, I want to know you. I really want to know your, your heart. And then uh, he said, he, he, asks, he asked Jeremiah, he said, now, wouldn't it be an abomination if a, if a man, uh, his wife divorces him? And goes marries another man, and then she divorces that other man, comes back to her husband. Would that not be an abomination? But God said, but I'm, I'll gladly do it. Mm-hmm. Even though a man wouldn't do it, I would gladly take my wife back, mm-hmm. meaning Israel. And I looked up in tears. I said, what kind of God are you? It's like I was stunned by his love. Mm-hmm. I said, Lord. I really want to know you. It's like a cry in my soul that began to just become deeper and greater. And uh, there's no greater cry now, and I'm not trying to impress anybody here. There's two things I want in my life today. I really, 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 really want to please him. Mm -hmm. And I really, 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 really want to know him. Beautiful. That's beautiful. That's all I I want in my life right now. Nothing matters anymore. But when you, when you really look at the Bible, there's a lot of, of things we are listening to today that are not in the scriptures. A lot of things. Mm-hmm. But it seems the one thing that happened to be a few days ago, uh, the, a button, I guess, I touched, which I wasn't even, I never thought people would respond like that. Mm-hmm. In the millions, they've watched that little clip. They, they, they didn't listen to the whole thing. They just took that few minutes and it went viral. It was all over India within three days and the UK and Europe. I was getting calls from everywhere. And uh, yes, Michael, I believe in giving. It's in the scriptures. Is it safe to say, just, is it safe to say this, that, your issue is not with prosperity. You believe in prosperity. I'm going to say it clearly for the first time and last time. Yeah. I believe in the promises of God. I believe in the blessings that he has promised. I believe God wants us to succeed. I believe God wants us to be blessed. I don't believe in the gimmicks anymore. So it's the method. Right. Right. You believe in sowing. You believe in I reaping. believe, look, look. You cannot love Jesus and not be a giver. There you go. You cannot love the Lord and not be a giver. Because love is giving and go. giving is loving. God does not have an issue with his people prospering. No. I don't like anymore the word prosperity. I think the word prosperity 
people start thinking negative about the world. I would rather say the blessings of God. Yeah. Okay? So let's just focus on does God want to bless us? Yes. There you go. Does he want us to, to succeed in life? Yes. Of course. He promised to meet our needs. That's in scripture. But when I hear a man today, and I did hear it a lot, you know, a lot. So this amount and claim this promise, it's not in the Bible. Why do you say that's not in the Bible? It's not because you cannot put a price on a promise of God. You, you cannot say, now claim these seven promises with your gift. No, no, that's not in the scripture. That grieves the Holy Spirit. It, it's an offense to the Lord. Because we, we, we have to understand something about God's heart. When Paul the Apostle wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And it's, such, it's, it's beautifully placed. That God Almighty is so pleased with the people who give themselves first to the Lord. So here the church in Macedonia, who lived in poverty, not prosperity, mm -hmm. poverty, yet they were rich in their spirit and gave out of love to the Lord to where he said that they were begging us to take the gift. Where Paul is saying, no, no, don't give this much. And the church says, no, no, please take it. They, and he said they gave themselves to the Lord first. And then to us, meaning to serve the church, the elders. And so they took their gift. And what Paul was saying to the church in Corinth is, I told you a year ago about this offering. That is to go to Jerusalem because the saints had gone through some famine. And the church wanted to help the church in Macedonia. In Macedonia wanted to help the saints in Jerusalem who gave them the gospel. And he's saying to, to the ones in Corinth, I already told you about this. I'm sending Titus to remind you. You already made your promise to me. So when we come, make sure you're ready. I'm paraphrasing. Sure. And then he says, now here's the, the way the church in Macedonia responded. Meaning, I expect the same from you. Mm -hmm. And then he said this. He said, as you abound in faith, as you abound in knowledge, as you abound in diligence, abound by this grace also. Meaning that when you give, let it be equal to your faith and love for the Lord. Right. And then he said, prove the sincerity of your love. Prove it. Now, when uh, Jessica has a birthday, Joshua has a birthday, my Tasha, who I wish was here, I love you, has a birthday. My Lily has a birthday. I go out and I buy the best gift I could find for them. And when Michael has a birthday, tomorrow, he's going to get a gift too. Amen. It shows how much... <laughs> what, what did you say? Amen. Amen, yeah. <laughs> I love you so much. It shows how much you love them. Because you bring a gift to say, I love you. It, when it's Christmas, you give a gift to your family members you love. But birthdays are special. Because birthday, you want to tell the man, the woman, the child whose day it is to say, I'm so glad you were born. So we give gifts out of love. How much more? Yes. Jesus. Yes. To give him out of hearts of love. So when, when the message today is, is preached in some circles. I want to say some circles. That's not even brought up. In, in, instead it's gimmick. The, they abuse the truth of the message. They focus on what am I getting back? What am I getting back? Not what am I doing for the Lord I love. What am I getting back for it? 
and, 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 and they hear these promises that are not biblical. You're going to get this much in this many days. Well, how many people do you know that ever got a hundredfold return in seven days or whatever, in a week or a month or whatever? That's the problem. Would and you sadly, say God is putting his finger but, but, on the motive. Yes, but I must yeah. say this. I must say this. I said those same things uh -huh. because of pressure. I was trapped. I went to a certain place not long ago, and I ministered so powerfully on the Holy Spirit. People were healed and blessed. And the man who had me forced me into a position live that I hated being in. When I walked, I said, I don't like this. This is not me anymore. I don't want this. Because they trap you to be in a place you don't want to be in. Finally, I said, it's time for me to tell the world. And I didn't think that many would listen. It's time for me to tell the world, this is a, a soul matter. This is my heart. I just don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I've grieved you enough in my past. I've already hurt you enough in my past. I don't want to hurt him anymore. Period. About anything. I still have a problem loving my enemies. But I want to. Right. And I said, Lord, you told me to love my, my, my enemies. Please help me. That I really want to. And then you, you, you read another portion in, this, in the scripture. And my real, my real uh, challenge today is how can I truly, and I'm being as blunt and raw as I can, how can I truly deny self and care to my cross? I want to with all my being. That's my cry today. I want to be a true disciple of the master. I want to deny the world and self and care to my cross and follow him. Whatever the cost, whatever it takes. So that's the gospel. Before, before I'm gone. Yeah. And truly preach the gospel. Yeah. That's what I want. Because nobody is preaching the cross. Someone has to preach it again. And it's just not me. It's you and, and so many others. So you... you you, you, you hear these amazing servants of the Lord, the Franklin Grahams, uh, the uh, Robert uh, Morris. Morris in Dallas and from Gateway and others. What a precious word they're giving. And they're standing strong for the, for, for the Lord Jesus. I'm so glad. Okay. Now, let's add to their voices. Let's be another voice. You be another voice. That we preach the cross of Jesus. We have to preach the cross again. And the cross, the cross is, means to deny these things. Deny self and the world. Well, how can you say, I'm carrying my cross, and yet you're saying things that don't line up with that? That's the problem. So, yes, I, I've, I've caused quite a stir, and some of them, some of them, whoever the them are, are not happy with me. No, it doesn't, doesn't move me at all. I, wanna, I, I want one person to be happy with me. Him, that's it. So, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to change my stand. It, no, never, never, never. But people may still see the remnants of the past. And, oh, I see Benin changes his mind. No, 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 no. That's a teaching that's still running around out there. Someone running a new, uh, an old program and they think I'm saying it again. Never, 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 never. And I told my staff, I said, you cannot put anything in the mail that I don't believe no more. You can't put anything on this is your day that, that I don't believe anymore. You cannot. You will not. And they're doing their best to make sure they go back in the history 
of the thousands and thousands of programs and tapes to remove things. I don't want in there. I don't want any next generation to see an old tape and say, oh my Lord, look what he said there. It's not going to happen. So we're going to erase it. It's going to take us a long time to clean all this stuff. But with the technology today, maybe we can do it quicker. I don't know. Let's hope. But I'm, I'm going to close with this because I think it's going to get late here. But, and we are going to have communion, right? We'll do it next week. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, dear Michael, I want to point to one thing. Let's forget the prosperity matter right now, the blessings of God matter, which I already said, and I don't want to ever talk about it again. I'm done talking. So I said it. It's done. No more. Thank you, Michael, for letting me. Love now. You. But now let me... Can, can I take a few more minutes? Just a few seconds, and then you can ask me anything else you want on other things. Listen. I believe the coming of the Lord is sooner than you think. Our eyes are about to behold Him. The lover of our souls and the love of our life, sweet, wonderful Jesus. He needs you to stand up for him. He is calling everyone in this room to carry his and her cross and deny the world. Shut that world out of your life. Remove the old man. Paul said, put off the old man with all its lusts and corruptions. It's time to really be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Whatever the cost, whatever the cost, whatever the cost. Because, because the Lord is grieving over his people. You know, the Lord that we love is very sensitive. His heart is broken. He is looking for someone to stand with him. You know, we don't know the Lord till we spend time with him. Right. He is the sweetest, most gentle, most precious. <laughs> ah, forgive me. Gentle, gentle shepherd. How can I... How can I hurt that precious one with a message that's hurting his people? How can I hurt him when I preach something that's not in his word, whatever it may be? We have to forgive our enemies. We have to love our enemies. We have to forgive each other. It's tough to do. But with him, all is possible. And the Holy Spirit, His presence, we all want His presence. And what He asks of us is one thing. Give up the world. Shut the world out. Do not entertain the flesh. Do not entertain the things that God Himself has delivered us from. He even hates the very garments touched by the flesh, it says in Jude. So here, here we have this sweet Savior that's so real to us. And you, you, you read his word with new eyes because all, all you see is love. All you see is love in the Bible. You, you don't see anything but love. Mm -hmm. Even God talking about the law, giving Moses the details of the law. Why would God be so interested to offer his people such, such a privilege to even, to even talk to him? What, what, what kind of God is that? Yeah. Forgive me. <laughs> to allow humanity access to the throne. Yeah. Angels don't have that access. We do. Angels don't. We do. 
No angel can ever look up and say, Jesus, I love you so much. No angel. And only we can. And when we preach these messages that are hurting him, it's time to stop. When someone sits on a TV program and is ashamed to say his name, it hurts him. Yeah. He, he gave them a platform. He gave them a platform. Right. He gave them a ministry. And when it comes to talking about his name, they won't even mention his name. How would you feel? If you give somebody some special platform and they don't even mention your name, they're ashamed to talk about you. How dare they do that to the Lord? How dare they? How, how dare a man or a woman with, a, with a, a big ministry sit on some secular program and not mention his name? How dare they? I'm not in the place today to, you know, be invited by the big TVs like I was. But I'll never forget when Larry King asked me. I remember that. And I was with Larry King three times. And he, he, and he was a little tough on me. He said, will Muslims go to heaven? Will, will Hindus go to heaven? I said, the Bible says. I didn't give him my opinion because I knew where he was going with that. I said, the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And, and, and then Larry King says, what do you say? I said, I don't, it doesn't matter what I say. I'm telling you what Jesus said. And Catherine Kuhlman was on Phil Donahue years ago. And, and all she said is, the Bible says, the Bible says, that's our, our answer. When someone puts us in a tough spot, trying to trick us into answering something they want us to answer, all we need to say is the Bible says. That's it. And when, when Catherine, when Miss Schoolman, when, when Phil Donahue, some of you don't even know the name Phil Donahue, but the old timers do. When Phil Donahue said to Miss Schoolman, stop hiding behind the Bible. She said, oh, Phil, it's the best place to hide. The only place to hide. Because she, she knew that the world would not understand. But my heart today is simply for the Lord. I don't want to disappoint him. I've done enough of that in my lifetime in the past. More than you people realize, okay? No more. He's, he, he's too precious and too holy and too sweet to be injured by preachers or anyone. So we have this picture of Jesus, the, the tough Nazarene, the carpenter. Yes, that is true. Mm -hmm. But never forget he's the gentle shepherd. Yeah, never right. forget he's the sweet rose of Sharon. Yes. Never forget he's the all-lovely one. Never forget he will not even quench, it says, a wick. That's right. So this precious Jesus, if you love him, prove it. Prove it by the way you live. Prove it by the things you say. I'm not there yet. I want to be there. I'm all my being, I want to be there. I'm not there yet. I still struggle with a lot of things in my life. To be a real Christian, to please the Lord. Every day, every day I tell him, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Because I don't like what I see inside of me. Cast me not away from your presence, Lord. Never. Don't ever throw me away. I will know what to do. Never take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me and give me that willing spirit. Uphold me with a willing heart that I can't even have on my own. Give me the joy of salvation, Lord, that I may win the loss for you. Yes. But the thing that 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 we we want, and I pray to God you're all listening. That on that day, when we stand before him, he will smile. He'll smile. Yeah. Because repentance then will be too late. It's, 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 it's my love for the Lord. I love him too much to injure him. 
I don't want to do anything or say anything that is not in his word. That's it. And like Martin Luther, who stood and said, my conscience is bound to the word of God. You can't go nowhere. And I would tell these young, young people here that are sitting listening. Your future. I may not even get the chance to tell you that again. Who knows? God may take me home tomorrow. I hope. <laughs> My kids don't like that, but I'm ready to go. I really am. I just feel the Lord has a lot for me to still do, so I'm going to stick around a little longer. But because, because the Lord said to me very clearly, I don't know if I should share everything, but I, I know what I have to do. I know what I have to do now. Uh, and I will not, I'll not turn away, no, never. And, and I do believe the Lord's going to let me finish what he started. Because I said to myself, I want two things before I'm gone. I want to see people saved, and I want to see the church strengthened. And today I'm focusing, because when I show up in glory, I, I really want the Lord to look and smile. I'm, for, I'm focusing on helping the persecuted Christians around the world. I've become good friends with David Curry from uh, Open Doors. And uh, I'm, I'm hearing things from him about the persecution of Christians. 249 million Christians today are under persecution. Nearly 10,000 every year are getting killed worldwide. And I want to do something, but I've got to raise my voice. So I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying that, that the Lord will open a door for me to talk to some powerful people in our government. Uh, and things are already happening. I cannot talk about that. Uh, that we need to do something to, to help these sweet people in Pakistan and Somalia and Iran, North Korea. 50,000 Christians today are in labor camps in North Korea. 50,000. They're, they're, they're uh, under such persecution today in Pakistan and India. It's, it's, uh, it's not right that we need to, uh, that we're quiet. And my, my other burden today is to help the children of the people who have been left behind uh, in Iraq and Syria. When, when ISIS was there, they killed many Christians. Right. And today their, their children have nowhere to go. Right. The little kids uh, are left on the streets because of the, of the devilish acts of ISIS. Uh, and Christians today are suffering greatly. So... I pray the Lord will, will give me the, the opportunity to, to do whatever I can to help. But most of all, let Jesus be the center of our hearts. So can we, can we lift our hands and tell him how much we all love him? Thank you, Lord. Can, can the gentleman come back on sure, the insulin? David. Now, you may have other questions, but I think I'm done talking. Yeah, I'd just like to say what I think what I'm hearing and what we're all hearing is that you love the scriptures. More than ever. That you believe in the promises of God. More than ever. That you believe in giving. Of course. You believe God loves to prosper his people. Correct. But the motive is this, like Paul said, though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. And what I'm hearing is the issue has been the methodology, not the truth of the scripture regarding giving. You, you would tell every pastor... Because I've received calls from pastors. I think you would tell every pastor that you believe in teaching on giving. On Absolutely, tithing. Michael. So, I mean, I don't know how clearer I can get. So I, I want to say we support you. There's a band of young, gener young generation preachers who are celebrating the stand you've taken. And I believe it's going to have a residual effect for generations to come. It's going to add a, a holiness to the environment of the church and an invitation into the depths of his presence that we haven't known. So I want to say we all here and those watching, we celebrate, Bob, the stand you're making. We love you and thank you for the life you've poured out and thank you for your transparency. Thank you for 
being an open door. Yeah. We love you and honor you. Love you. God bless you. Thank you. Please take, take a seat. You're so kind. I do want to say something to all of you about Michael uh, and Jessica. And I want our people watching on social media to know this. I believe the Lord has given you uh, a great office in Orlando. I believe the Lord is going to bless the city through this ministry here. I would ask all my partners to support Michael and Jessica, not because they're my family, more than that because they truly are anointed. And um, if you don't have a church to go to, this would be a good one to go to. I'm praying that God will soon give you your own property. Yes, Lord. And I believe he will. Amen. And I don't want to go home to heaven till I see you in your own property. Amen. And uh, I'll gladly help you. You'll have to stick around a bit then. Uh, I, let me finish now. <laughs> I'll gladly, I'll gladly come back and help you in the winters. Good. We were summer. Wouldn't we love him to be around more often? Yeah. Summer. Summer. I'm going to stay in California. Uh, I love Orlando. I love the memories here. But uh, I'll come when the Lord opens the way. I'm not going to promise. That I'm going to move here. As much as you all want me to move here, I'll just come and go. I will never have a church here. Those days are behind me. As much as people have said, oh, please open a church. No, uh, I'm not going to open a, a church. There's already one open here, and I'll be a part of this one when I come. And I was telling Jessica sitting there uh, when you were giving that magnificent altar call today, how God has blessed you. You truly are anointed for this and for this hour. And uh, this uh, Jesus uh, 19, uh, 19 conference will be your greatest. Oh, my Lord. And, uh, and I'm going to ask everyone watching on social media, make sure to come to the conference. This is going to be probably the greatest ever oh, uh, conference in this city. Uh, and I, I sense it deep in my soul. I know the speakers, I don't know if they can put them on the screen while we're talking. Um, you have some of the greatest people coming. Oh, they're there, okay. Um, and and uh, you people will be very blessed to come and be a part of this amazing gathering uh, in Orlando. Uh, December 29 through January 1st. What a way to start the yeah. new year too. So uh, make plans now to come. And, and uh, Michael, I'm asking our people who are watching on Facebook uh, to, to pray and to support you even financially, those especially living in this part of the U.S., uh, to get that property you must have. And I'm going to give you a charge in front of all of them. Okay, another one? Another one, yeah. Okay. <laughs> because, see, I believe, I believe... I, 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 I believe I have uh, some understanding uh, that you don't yet about the history of Orlando and the future of Orlando. Because I was here for many years. And the young people don't realize the blessings of God that Orlando has already experienced in the, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. And... Uh, the great move of the spirit that took place here. There's a lot of good seeds sown in the land here. The, the city of Orlando has been chosen by the Lord a long time ago to be a center for the gospel or one of the centers of the gospel. So for, for, for you to be here, is, is that's on, on, only God can do that. So now you must get your own property you must launch out in faith 
God will be with you. Claim it and go for it. Claim the land and then possess the land. Don't worry about the money. It will come by itself. God will supply all the needs miraculously. But you must, you must make that decision that by a certain time, I will do this. And you become uh, very bold, very bold. Uh, The time for timidity is past for all of us. We have to be bold. When I began OCC, I was bold. When I went to the lady who owned where the church sits today on Forest City, dear Mrs. Brewer, I said, the Lord told me that's my land. And I didn't have a cent in my pocket. But I knew, I said, it's my, this, this will belong to the Lord. And she looked at me after her son began to argue with me because it was already under contract. She said, young man, my husband told me before he died, the only thing on that land will be a church, it's yours. But I, 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 I had to say it with boldness. It's time, Michael, it's time for you and Jesse to launch out in faith into the deep. Remember the wonderful scripture. You know, Lord, we've toiled all night and caught nothing, but at your word, Lord. Wow. And I think the Lord has spoken. So may I, may I uh, make a request before I'm done? I want uh, to, to ask all of you to pray for me the next few days and weeks uh, that the Lord will do what he uh, wills in my life. Begin to pray, begin to call on the Lord and and I must finish well, and I will finish well. I'm determined to finish well. Uh, the road ahead may be a little rocky here and there, but it doesn't matter to me. So, final thing I want to say is quite, quite one thing. That Jesus be the center of your hearts. Love him only and none other. Amen. And if you still have some attachment to the world, let go. It's time you let go. Amen. Would you mind playing that nice instrument, David? Can I ask people to sure. do something? That yeah. I think many of you are uh, hungry for a new walk. Go ahead, David. Go ahead. Many of you are hungry for uh, a new relationship. I've experienced much in my life, but nothing like what I'm going through now. Nothing. Wow. No, nothing as precious. All the great moments in the past can't even compare Amazing. with my time with the Lord today. And uh, many of you are sitting here listening to all I said. I didn't answer many questions because he, he didn't have the chance to ask me many questions. Maybe some other time. But uh, if you feel in your life that something is holding you back, whatever it may be, it's, 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 it's time to say no more. Because the coming of the Lord is very, very near. Closer than I think most of us realize. And the next few years are going to be difficult for the church in this country. And we must be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We must. We must. We must stand firm. We must watch. Our prayer life must come back with power. Daily, we can't miss. We cannot neglect one day. Yes. Coming to the Lord in prayer and humility. And we can never again ignore his precious word. We, let's shut the TVs out. Let's say goodbye to the world. Let's say goodbye to the, to the things we've enjoyed in the past. And let's open that sweet, precious word of God again. And let the Lord talk to us. If you believe that there are things in your life that must go, but you need help. I've gone to the Lord on my knees many, 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 many times to say, Lord, I cannot change my heart would you please change my heart for me i cannot do this would you do this for me because i know how weak we are how wretched we are and only the lord can make the change 
my cry lately has been, give me a love I've never had for you. Because yes. only you can do that, Lord. So if you have that desire to really be more and more like the Lord, why don't you just get up out of your seats and come kneel here and just talk to him. And just give him everything. And you in your homes, you do the same in your homes. You just get on your knees right where you are and just talk to the Lord. Let him hear your heart. And then let it continue with him. Daily in your own prayer closet, you can do the same. <laughs> 